first thing I'd like you to do is um, you guys you're gonna turn around to the people behind you and then later in twos and in twos, just discuss two concepts that are in the name of this class, but but we've not necessarily talked about them and probably have preconceived ideas about them. Beyond the first study we have to But what do you think is meant by calibration and what do you think is meant by calibration? And you guys will bring it out. What? 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 What?
removal of viruses. Okay. Something else by jumping back? Yeah. Instruments that bring to your physical parameter. Instruments that is to your physical parameter. Relationship diversion is a relationship with different variables. Anything else? So, how is medication different? What is medication? The same, there's no, I mean, so don't think about it. The whole point of being together is that it's comfortable being wrong together or having biases together and then help each other, maybe think about a good thing. Using an independent measurement system or a way to measure the same thing. Independent measurement to do what? To compare with another. Yes. Yeah, this is in your So this follows calibration. And assesses it. So that, that, what I didn't understand it by So, so we so we calibrate first and then we validate with with ground post calibration. So in the case of that, I could say um, I cannot go calibrate up there, but I can see if I can see So consistency, something like that. Anything else? So I'll, I'll now provide you things I found online, and, and I'm inviting all my co-teachers also to challenge uh, those things. But, Basically, calibration is a process that ensures that accuracy is maintaining the measurement produced by the equipment. The most important thing is that you have a reference standard. And in the US and in, in the rest of the world, there's agencies that provide standards. The rest for the same. Which one is it in the US? There was a I'm very happy to have her here because you might have a career at least, and these are the people we go to to make sure that when we that they, they do several things. One is they help you come up with a calibration procedure for the instrument. And then they, they test and provide traceable material that you can calibrate with. So 
And it's also the process that converts, as you said, raw data, volts, count, into data in physical units, for example, English or chlorophyll in micrograms to the so we think you can think about the least traceable bits or the kind of the flax as materials that is traceable to this this refractive track and 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 beads that we then use to as part of our calibration. Okay. And it assures accuracy of measurements, but in the sense that if you know something about our so that it's that uh, they don't have uncertainties, that you're able to come up with uncertainties and trace uncertainties. Instruments change in time. I mean, we use instruments that have light sources, and these light sources change their characteristics in time. And therefore, we must periodically calibrate that instrument. There is a community knowledge about the rate of drift of instruments, so you could use that to calibrate should I study every year, should I calibrate every time. Use my equipment, for example, with respect to the other, we can do it every time we do so. Uh, and identify if there's a drift measurement and, and etc. And uh, and so the standard procedure in my community, more and more, there's a big repository called Ocean Best Practices, where you can find uh, protocols. One of the issues with the OBP is that you might find different protocol for the same measurement. How do you know which one is the right one to use? So now there's a process with Ocean Best Practice that's an endorsement. So you, you have things like, um, uh, it could be, for example, the IOCCG that endorses specific protocol of the IOCCP or other organization that, of scientists that endorses, this is the protocol we endorse from the You can see it happens more because they realize that there's no within, they're not, if you submit a protocol, they don't validate with the rest of the community. So the validation procedure of, of that, validation is different than what we got here. So the, the process of making sure there's buying from the community needs to take place. And in the end, this is absolutely critical because when, if, if when uh, Darius goes on a cruise and does PRC, does blanks differently than Ivona, it does blanks differently than, than Mike Berenfeld, you'll have a hard time comparing those PRC measurements. Even though, you know, they're supposed to give you uh, uh, the same parameter at the end. One of the advantage of, uh, for me, of working with Tara is that it measures all over the world the same way. You, some might argue the same wrong protocol, but at least it's compared, it's cross comparable within. And so this is also why you'll see with the IOCCG, there's a big, big effort in the past few years to do international protocol. It's not anymore NASA protocol, it's IOCCG protocol on purpose. So there's a buy in by all uh, space agencies so that people in Japan and people in South Africa and people in the US, all make measurements the same way, or at least test to how different their way is from somebody else. So then when you come and go to a database and download data, you have an expectation that they were collected the same way, so they're comparable. If you want to download them or whatever it is you may want to use the data for. That's really important. The validation part is a documentary process that provides assurance of the product service or system consistency, so it's a consistent result of what you, you have done. There's no reference standard when you do that. Uh, it provides, yeah. And, and this is, in my mind, I think about this when I think about closure. I'm trying to get the same answer in different ways, and are they within what I think is the uncertainty of those that they should be? So, you know, my, my BBP, uh, well, we'll get there. Okay. Yes. You can also think of it as validation is the step you take before you start doing science with the data. Yes, absolutely. So, as we said before, 
we don't trust our data and until it cross some, it try to convince us it's good. So I would never write a paper when I use a data set that I did not challenge with other data sets or with other papers or something like that. I, I always look for, how do I know that what I collected is what, what What is it I'm looking in it that will tell me, ah, you know, so-and-so published a paper independently, in different instrument. Is a to the one I have a little more confidence in that. And then there's another interesting, ah, uh, oh, I thought I had another slide on. Sorry, vibration, vibration. There was one on verification that I don't see. Okay, so there's another procedure. I don't know how I deleted that slide called verification. And verification um, is different than validation in the sense that now I'm challenging a calibration. So for example, if I calibrate with, with uh, ah, it will, come, it will come later. It is coming later. It's coming later because I, I, I'm going to compare. So we'll get there. we we'll get to verification. Sorry, I was up at three o'clock this morning. So it's, it's taking, it's all good. It's all good. It's my own doing. Uh, so we're going to focus here on one sensor, the FLBD, the kind that goes along the case. So now we're going to apply this concept to it. And it has two sensors. It's like the simplest thing you might have. It has a backstab sensor that measures scattering by all things in the water, and then a crossing for all the shape. Hopefully, it's going to manage the process of hiding. And this is a schematic from, from Nathan Briggs. And uh, often we also do a dark. So the, the, the standard operating procedure is to put tape on the on the platform that I'm using. The platform the dark changes with the platform you with with uh, unfortunately with the platform you're on. Not by a lot, but by sufficient counts that it could be. Uh, in very clear water bias in this. So, unfortunately, this used to be done by the Argo team and they stopped doing it because it's too difficult. That's it. Not my decision, yes. So, I'm just very curious about this argument about putting in water to match with that. That's one of the there's, and this is, would be a great project in this class. To see if you do in, have to put it in water or not to get consistent dollars. With the same sensor, we have three of them here. That's all we did. Do the dark in water, do the dark in air, see if you get different results. Is this a myth or is this something that absolutely has to be done? Or is it affecting something else? Or is it an issue of, uh, for example, the initial refraction change? I mean, if there's an epoxy at the top there that channels light from source to refraction. So, but the standard procedure, if you read papers, including my own, you have to put it in water because that's more stimulating than the initial But if you could do it in air, then maybe we can convince the Argo team of the US to do it. Yes. So the, the, yeah, I put them actually on both. You can put it on detector only, you can put it on the source only, you can put it on both. You put it on detector because there's ambient light, so you don't want any light to get in. It's the darker and white measure from the nothing comes. And all these sensors would have a dark It's like the reality of the no, it's it, it's critical. It's on the detector. It's not so yes. critical. It's on the source. But I'd love one of you to test that. I mean, this is where this is a great place where the, a project could be. Let's test that. Yes. Yes. So that the water is on the other side. Yes. Yeah. But as Colin said, she's not convinced it needs to be water. That's really near. Can we get other differences? Well, I'm just not convinced because you're yeah. not the water. Refractive um, effect is when you have, you know, light going through the optical glass when you put water. If you have tape over it, 
and the what and the light is going through. It's not a package. I'm not saying it doesn't matter if it's not dark. I'm saying it's not about the index of For the dark, she says for the dark measurement, in principle, it should be not. Yeah, but it definitely is different if you um you know, are in a dark room and you don't take it, you hold it in air and you get a very, very small reading, but it'll be a different reading if it were in a dark room in quads. You know what I'm saying? Yes. So that's the refractive index difference. But some of the other things that you can find out by not putting it in water is sometimes there's sort of electrical instabilities of your sensor. And for that in salt water, it's a completely different reading than when it's in air. And so that I agree it should be in water, but I'm not just not convinced about changing the refractive index of the optical glass when that is not in contact with the water when you put it in water. But what we know is that we get different arcs when we put it on a platform versus we just take the sensor and put it to a power supply in the lab. Those are regularly different by systematically by about five. Yes. Platform, I mean, you'll see we, we got it for the, for uh, when we're going to deploy it. I mean, we have sensors like this attached to a set to a set in platform functionality, or it's going to be uh, attached to a, an optical pack going down, or it's profile enclosed. But it's not the same source as your source of energy. It has its own impedance, it has its own circuitry, it's different than the power supply. Thank you for asking. So the calibrated value is going to be this raw minus dark times the way we get it, it's going to be raw minus dark, and then there's a state factor. So now I'm going to talk about how we get the state factor. That's the calibration procedure. So typically, this is one of the way the eco sensors are calibrated using niche traceable beads. And here I give you an example of what's written on the bottom of something. So what you see is there is, these are very expensive beads. Every little thing like this is $300. And they have an expiration date. It is when it's November 21. They have a nominal size. I don't know why they jump. It shouldn't be. And I did not record it. Um, it probably is. I just don't know how to use it. <laughs> <laughs> So the nominal size is 100 nanometer, but the position of this 100 nanometer can be plus minus six nanometer. So there's, they have, there's an uncertainty even in the value of this nanometer. So in this example, it's going to be 100 plus minus six nanometer in the position of the center. In addition to that, it has a dispersion with a 6.8. Uh, 6.8 nanometer. That's the standard deviation around that mean that has its own uncertainty. And we have 6% uncertainty in the, in the exact position. And then on top of it, there's a tail in the orbital size. This is from the manufacturer and it's this first principle. You have a log number, which is really important because this is how you go back. If there was a problem, you tell people, look. Well, everybody should use that law. There's been a problem with calibrating the That's that's where traceability comes. Now, in terms of the optical properties, there's a whole there's a variety of index refractors published in the literature. There's not a there's not a single value everybody agrees on. If you look in the literature, they vary by about two percent. In the index refractor, remember for me calculation, I need size. I need this information. I need information about the index refraction. And what other information do I need? Wavelength factors. I need a wavelength, so let's look at that. So I need a wavelength information. I need to know what's the wavelength and what's the I need lambda. I need to know. Sigma lambda, because these sensors typically are 20 nanometer long. And then I also need to know what's their angular response. What are they able to see? And these numbers are theoretical. 
turns out. They're not being measured. These are based on what they, they're being a section of the cones and just, you know, building a, a, a model that based on those cones tell you what the lighting angle is for these sections. So the bottom line is everything is not normal. When you run a meteor, and this is how it was done in the beginning, they would run it with one end, one size of the piece, one wavelength, the nominal wavelength, and then one angle, the angle of the base that we put out, and they use that. Now you've seen how me theory for a single particle looks. It's very awesome. So if you so the uncertainty was huge. People did not report them, they did not check them, whatever. But but there be large differences uh, between instruments. And it also turned out that the wavelength response is not simply what the manufacturer tells you is the wavelength. When we go and put a radiometer in front, we often find differences of about five nanometers between what the manufacturer tells you the wavelength is and what I measure. So you cannot even trust if you don't verify yourself, it, it, it might be off. And all these things and the, all these true things, you know, the mysteries will add to what should be the correct uncertainty in your calibration. You have a slope and you have a delta of that slope. If you probably correctly all these uncertainty in your meter to generate uh, uh, a slow factor. Yes, Bob. So I, I would I'd really like to think about how much time it would take to do that versus the one week. So that should be time that you could issue a proposal in terms of the time you need to do the work that needs to be done. Trust the manufacturer to do it for you. That, that's the bottom line. Don't trust the manufacturer. Manufacturer, it this takes time, it takes work, and unless the community complains, they're not going to improve the position. They want to sell sex. They want them to be right, but they're not going to spend time on it unless you complain that it's not right. Calibration is not their primary, in, you know, uh, motivation. But it turns out that for backscattering, you can use another method. We can even have this method to do calibration of backscattering. And that's the black method. We from, from Wayne about it. So you, know, you put uh, 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 parallel to your sensor, a plaque of known reflectance comes from uh, that sphere. It is traceable. And you scan your the volume in which your being goes. And you basically map your, your the, the volume that your sensor is going to work. And, it's, and in the process, it's sensing in all the angles that are between your source and receiver, all the backstaring angles that happen. And you can build now the optical model of everything that your sensor is doing. One huge advantage of this is that we, with LEDs, if you look at sensors, they are hot spots. They're not homogeneous. This would take account of it. This does not, and there's no way to take account of it. No way. Unless you, you know, you, you, you map it and do 3D Monte Carlo model of your sensor. So this is, the nice thing is this is simplicity.
So here we come to the process of verification. So verification is when I'm taking two different ways of calibrating sensors. Now, I put, either I do it on the same sensor, I put two sensors in the work, supposed to measure the same thing, put them side by side and calibrate them, and I look at how well they do each other. It's really a test of my calibration. It's more specific than, than validation. Validation, we try to write the same result, but there's large uncertainties because you know we, we're comparing cantology or we're comparing to a set, we're comparing POC to growth. We know they should be within each other, you know, in some range between themselves in, in the upper ocean, but it's it's we allow for we tolerate bigger uh, uncertainties. With verification, from my perspective, it's really true calibration procedure, both of them traceable, and we're trying to test. Can they be used? So it's similar to, and here I quote Meg, who looked at these slides before, to cross calibration. So another way to get to the same answer, but the, you know, with, with narrow answers, is what we do in closure or in validation. And so now I'll show you two examples where the two field campaigns where data was used to do verification. So the first one was an exercise led by Antoine Poteau, where all the BGC Argo fleet at the time was used to have backscattering sensors. And the idea was, let's look deep, deep in the ocean where we expect little origin. And on those floats, we have three different technologies, all from Seabird. We had the Eco 3D3 type sensor that had an acceptance angle. They had a, a view, um, yeah, they, they had a scattering angle around 120, back scattering around 120 degrees. Then there were the FLBBs, which were around 140 degrees. And then the MCOMs that are around 150. And from all Backscattering is the one. So they have they have different and all of those are calibrated with B. Wait, that's not correct. The way they should be calibrated with B, but the way uh, WhatsApp did it is they would have a what they call golden sensor on which they spend the three hundred dollars to calibrate with B's, and then everybody else, every other sensor was cross calibrated to that sensor. And periodically they check which means again that that sensor. And then what do they cross calibrate again? Um, yeah, I think it's formal as long as series or something like this. Okay, but it's not clear, it's not a website. Yeah, I think it's a form as indivision series or uh, something that's stable that they can buy commercially that it can be there. But you're right, there might be also integral that. But that's much cheaper. Uh, so for $50, you get a a thing like this, as opposed to that. Yes, so the calibration is the reason actually I'll teach you all to do it. I think we have a lab where we do it. It's a process in which you, you have a sensor in a dark bucket and you're measuring both with a transmissometer to give you the concentration of the beads and with, the, with your sensors to to then calibrate to what beta should be registered. And I recently wrote, wrote a, a piece of code that I did on ECAP and we still found problems with it, but now at least I'm consistent with other people's code, which is great. It's on ECAP that takes account of all these uncertainties, assuming you know that. So it allows for this to change, it allows for this, it allows for this, it allows for the wavelength and for the angle. As long as these assumptions are correct, you will get uh, a slow factor for those beads. I mean, so you're getting a beta over C. What you're getting out is a beta over C ratio plus an uncertainty in that ratio. And since you're measuring the C of the beads and you're measuring beta in counts, you can convert that to your translating factors with the uncertainty. And the uncertainties I find are on the order of. 15%, and you find papers in the literature that say it's 5%. So this is on, only on theoretical grounds. Not, not, so, so I think we, we, we're, yeah, we're an over-optimistic bunch. But so Altuan did this 
uh, th this this uh, exercise. It took all the flow data between 900 and 950 of these three, uh, the eco triplet, eco for the DNA and cones. And what do you see here? There is something standing out to you. Is there one technology that seems to be distributed different than the others? Yes, exactly. The eco triplet seems to have a distribution that's different than the other, which could not be explained by the geographical location of those sources. It was not like these were the Pacific Ocean, these were the Atlantic, and maybe that's a property of the environment. They came from similar environments. Most of those in the Southern Ocean, and many in the Mediterranean, because the French love the Mediterranean. Um, they live nearby, and with European funding, you cannot propose it everywhere you have to live about the Mediterranean. So this seemed to be an outlier. And lo and behold, Siebert was confronted with those data and we got new calibration coefficients for all those flows that came after. They went back to their books and they traced an error in one of the parameters that they used in the calibration of those specific flows. And with this correction, suddenly things were on top of each other. I mean, Andrew, Andrew did that, that correction. He's not the responsible person for the wire network. And so, but they, because they were confronted by the community, they went back and tested, and an error was found. And humans err. This is what you do. You do well. So this is why I tell you: don't trust the manufacturer. Always question your instruments. Because had we not done this exercise, we would continue to be, you know, for the foreseeable future. And then the whole database of our was, was was reprocessed to adjust for that. So this is one validation exercise. And this is different technologies in their ability to do backscattering. So, and this is a, a, a more in-depth exercise because here we also had sensors that were calibrated with flats and put the sensor calibrated. And, and so this is export in the North Pacific, a month long exercise with many assets. So two vessels, uh, Meg and I were on one, Colin was on another, gliders, wire walker, and BGC Argo floats, and all those had vector sensors. And what Zach did was really a, a Herculean effort. Every time two platforms were close to each other, we take that data and put it aside of the backscatter. Every time. So he he ended up with this. This was a, his postdoc with Ivona and, and, and Jeremy. He ended up comparing all these sensors that we see in every apex here. This is a sensor, 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 another sensor, 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 sensor. And calculated their you know, regress them against each other, found through offset and and uh, and what you find, so it's an equation of the, you know, he was looking for linear equations between them. And what's the slope, the slope of that integration would be linear. But you have a slope of 0.95, you'd say, ah, not too bad. And when you have a slope of 1.87, say, wow, 87% difference in the slope. And here we have 1.2, and 0 0.9, 0 0.94, 1.3, 1.4, 2.44, 2, .44, 2 of the same sensor interaction, two FLDs, both coming from the same rates constructed by the same manufacturer. Yes. They were close enough. You did not expect those type of differences. And it was, yeah, it's, it's the most yeah, boring environment you can imagine. <laughs> we were there among very little change in the optical problems of the water. What? I said, it's lovely if you like a gray, mellow 
Yeah. Uh, yeah. Be the whole time uh, there. This is a NASA project. We couldn't uh, once have a clear image. At, at the, when we went back home, we did. But not when we stayed on stage. 1.11 there. So you can see some sensors were calibrated with many others, and some were not because they see this one is also 2.13. So it's consistent with the 244 of the other. This is why we thought that the FLBD there, the LF, was an outlier. Something went wrong with that. Probably in the calibration or something. And so it's wrong. There's two independent sensors when they were compared on two different platforms, when they compared with it, had very different values. So it's not done with one sensor, it's done with two sensors at different times. And this one, for example, the BDC was only compared to this one because. The side right because only the side right was close enough. So this is really the don dirty laundry of our field. And this is what, what Zach did. It explores how well we can do backstab. And if you go to C, typically you go with one sensor. Manufacturer and the literature tells you you're off by five percent. Would be off by five percent. The satellite gave me a value that's two times higher. Satellite's wrong. So, yeah, I have a, a, my, one of my conclusion is that small error bars are not a sign of a careful scientist; they're a sign of an optimistic scientist. So a big difference was also found. So first, what it is is that outlier sensor corrected to agree with others. Uh, you went through a whole process. Uh, and then, then the one who became the one out was the, the black one, which is calibrated with the plates. So now we have a disagreement within the plate, calibrated ones, and the deep calibrated. And all the beads are consistent with itself, and the base is outside. Which one's right? I don't know. But for the for the for the purpose of this exercise, um, Zach thought that these sensor were more consistent also with values respect to the test, and he realigned the uh, the higher steps to, to agree with it. So this is what he did in order to be able for somebody that wanted to do science with all the platforms. To have consistent science. If you wanted to do, if each scientist used a different BB sensor to do his POC to BB relationship, we're going to be all over the map. So we want to have a consistent, at least cruise wise, back scattering. So this is the, the procedure that uh, Zach uh, suggested. So you might think, okay, well, it's only the BB on the FLB. That's, you know. What? Just again. Oh, <clears throat> sorry. My fingers get this. So we now are going to look at the FL part of the FL again, a sensor that's on the other plates. So if you look at what standards you can find in in in, uh, in the uh, uh, out there. Uh, you can find from Sigma Aldrich chlorophyll A extracted from spinach that you can then use in the lab as a standard. And some people use it with their uh, fluoromer. In the case of Seabird, they collected data with a diatom culture from which chlorophyll A was extracted. And that was used to, um, with a golden sensor, to become their standard. So that all the sensors give you exactly the same values in the same order. So they all can be cross calibrated. And Colin, correct me if anything I'm saying is or, or expanding. Well, just before you go, I would just, um, when you buy a standard from Sigma and they say 99% pure, and it says extracted from spinach, spinach is a four plate. 
that has both of these in it. And so there's, it's 99% sure, but it might also have trace amounts of chlorophyll B, which you know from your work in the lab here that chlorophyll B can give you um, in extract, we use some extra fluorescence, and I'm sure it's very small, but they also can provide you with a pure chlorophyll A standard that's purified from an alga that doesn't have chlorophyll B in it. And so you have the choice of spending a couple hundred bucks on each one, buy the one that doesn't have any, any studies of contamination of chlorophyll B. So what I'd like you to, to now among yourself again, I want to turn again and say, think what are the advantage and disadvantage of using stats as a standard for trophy for longer use in our Turn around again and think about what you think would be. Uh, yeah. Based on what you learned today. Presence of growth, potential presence. 
Any other Solution and not that. Sorry, the solution versus himself. Versus himself. That can be a box. Uh, they, they tell you what's the shelf life exactly on this? Are we, I, I didn't know shelf life for the Aldrich. For the Aldrich, um, I think the shelf life is as long as you put it frozen, it can be a couple of years. But once you put it into well, not put it into something, but once you put it into something, you haven't talked at all about what you're going to use to put it in water, so you put it in acetone, acetone, put it in ethanol, how to make it the standard. So if, once you put it into a solvent, um, you have to validate, validate that it hasn't changed. You have to validate that using absorbents. Okay. You need another instrument to be able to verify that it has, or HPSC, to make sure that it hasn't been done with one degradation products. We need verification. Absorption. Okay, so we'll get there. Okay. <laughs> we'll get there soon. So I think, and if we don't, you shout, please. Uh, so same model sensor category, similarly on land will provide consistent output in the field. They have them agree here, they agree in the field. They give me the same numbers. But this is not exactly the core here. Yeah. What do you know we have to do? We're after the profit in the cell, the profit in the kidney, what do we, we use as our standard for growth? What, what are we using as a standard for growth in the kidney? Culture. Maybe a little more culture. What, what do we use in the field? When we do measure in the field, what do we trust as a field? Uh, our standards of growth. Are they turners? So, what I'm hearing is that the way we determine what's the value of growth in the field is using spectral photometers. And turners. Did this have an asset that erases both of them? It's good we had this talk today. <laughs> <laughs> so we talked about it. So the approved method to do growth here, at least in our community, is called HPS. Added pressure liquid profile as a method to get growing growth hit. We've heard about it from, from uh, in Sasha's stuff, we've heard about it in other parts. Now, Pauline, would you take us through why turners are not the same as educational systems? So, uh, if you want to just back up one step, because there was one other thing that was missed on the previous slide. Yes. That is, what is the excitation on your barometer? Is that an ecosensor? What did you say? 479. What is the absorption coefficient of chlorophyll molecules in solution? Yeah, even lower than that. And it depends on your solvent. And so even if you could put your barometer, into a solvent to measure it, which I would recommend it to do have some toxins on your you will just dissolve your constraints. Um, it's not going to excite chlorophyll. So you literally can't use the purified chlorophyll standard for your barometer, your in situ barometer if you want to. It's not you know correct it. 
has made sure that I've been very, very clear on that. The way that they work is by stimulating the accessory pigments in the cell at 470. And those accessory pigments pass their energy on to chlorophyll. And then it progresses. Okay, so be very clear on that. So HPLC is the standard. How do we calibrate HPLC? Yeah, you know, we can do it. I've never seen, I've never read a paper on HPLC. So, what do you see there? What are the, they show you diagram with yeah. spikes. They show mm -hmm. the pigments. Do they show the pigment or do they show spikes that they attribute to pigments? Spikes that are attributed to pigments. What, so what are these spikes? What are they measuring? So they're measuring something as a function of time. The pigments go through a column, they get separated by polarity, have um, pigments coming out at a certain time, and there's a detector and it's measuring what? It's measuring an uncalibrated absorbance, an uncalibrated relative absorbance. And so relative to each spike, you can see differences in absorbance. Okay. But it's not absorption per meter because it's not a known path lane, there's not a known detection, they don't optimize for it. It's just measuring the intensity of light to each at one way for all the so how do you know how much pigment is associated with how much absorbance and how great absorbance? Standard? You can buy a standard for $300. I mean, this one tire is empty diester, and then it's, it's like $800. And you can run that a couple times. So standards are tremendously expensive because it's hard to get standards. So what else can we do? Standard. You have to make your own standard and measure it in what? Betcha for tolerance. You betcha. So everything comes back to absorption. And it's because we know we molar absorption efficiency of pigments because someone who is really carefully in the lab. So in specific go, solvents. In, in specific solvents and at specific wavelengths and you know exactly the absorbance per molecule. And so you make up your own standards, you run them in your own spectrophotometer, you check the dilutions in your spectrophotometer, and then you use that to calibrate your HPLC. And your terms. So every instrument that you're using is a step away from absorption. So again, you're going to be doing work with pigments, but the time that you need to do the calibration into your proposal, not just I'm going out to seek for a month, I need a month of time, plus maybe a month of analysis. You need another month to actually. You know, show that you've calibrated all of your sensors. It came through your effort. So, this is what NASA does too. They have standards. They have a whole they calibrate their HPLC. And they do a beautiful job. I mean, the whole chip came through the process. They're amazing. But you have to go through the process. It's, it's, it's not a work that's very expensive. One way or another, conservation of history. <laughs> pay me now, or pay me money, or pay me time. But it all comes back to special time. And about 15 years ago, there was a big crisis <laughs> in academia because there was the whole lab doing it to us. And it turned out that one lab was consistent enough. What we do is we send the samples to several labs. And so a whole data set had to be 
chart, which has turned out which we will see this part standard was not at this house. Maybe it was the lab that NASA developed. Maybe it was yes. NASA's lab. So that's when NASA did the internal people like And there are several labs in the world that do it. There's Australia, there's in, there's in uh, France, and, and they continuously compare between themselves to make sure that they find stuff. And there's some individual labs like that have called in that. But those are labs that do sort of those are places where the community sends their samples to do it. So in Europe, it's it's down to those But we always send to NASA sample, yeah. replicate samples to NASA to verify that we're getting the same answer as NASA. So if you're funded by NASA, you have to take uh 10% of the samples, it's 10% of the samples to NASA. So that they can assure that wherever you send your samples to so stuff and stuff is consistent. That's one of these verification processes. What's the cost of getting getting that sample? With what? Time sensitivity. If you're freezing in minus eighty, you can keep it closed. The filters. Yeah. And you send the filters. Don't send the extract. So it depends on my views. I mean, it's a student cruise. I just want to know. Right. But if it's for something real, um, please send it. But when you're filtering, like when we're on these cruises and you're filtering by like day and night, it's roughly, you know, I mean, it's one of those you have to like really pinch yourself because you're filtering the entire ocean. <laughs> and typically, we take singlets and not triplets. And the reason it's done is because these samples are really expensive. And the feeling in the community, again, disagree with it is that that's sufficient and because you deliver the cost of cruise, you do it all the time, you do it every day, whatever. So you have a protocol you're doing it while measuring other things that you can find out if uh, measurements, you know, if one of your samples is better. You might argue that's not the best way to do it, but then you, the, the problem is you have finite resources. Do I get three here in the same samples from the same bubble? Or is it better to work if I get the actual measurement? I do from time to time, do take all the from the same one, just to make sure. Okay. I use their uncertainty as a, as a sample to get a sense of the uncertainty. It's a nice way to see it. That's, that's the current setting. Because of the expense, it's, 80, it's around $80 to $100 less than. So what's the problem with the turners? Call in. What's the problem with the turners, and what might why might they be biased? What do you think? Well, it's Yeah, so, you, so how you calibrate is how you have to use it, right? So when I calibrated, I had a certain protocol that I used to calibrate it. I've established the ratio of which it's linear, and I have an uncertainty associated with that. And then you guys come in and you use it, and everybody in this room used it differently, right? Although the values were, were pretty reasonable, right? So some things are relatively small here, even though it seems like there's different uncertainty. But, you know, it's really about the protocol and how often that calibrates and come up and all those things. Are there something that they may source of bias? But what could that be? The growth could be in the sample and you do not also measure how much growth could be there in the sample. That would bias the growth. And really, you're fair by estimation. Convincing. So you can have a bias 
you to grow through weeds, but you don't know about them. It's not such a <laughs> so this is the reason in certain places in the in, in the world you find in, in some places you find a very consistent age in some places it's quite different. And it can be 60 percent. So it, it depends on the community composition. So this is why these are not used to do validation of code. It's a very quick way on the page to figure out what class you don't have instruction either. You just want to know, like, are we at 0.11? You know, what's our cost of course? I still think that they're great things to have. So, summary up to here is when you get data to analyze, do not assume it's good data. Yes. So all these values that we measure, like there's an uncertainty, so knowledge are uncertain. Yeah. It's yeah. not that they're not useful, but yeah. Profit changes three orders of magnitude. So it could be that, and we'll talk about it, it's, it's even worse than that. This is, this is, if these were all uncertainty, it's like the people. They're not flowering, actually. So. But it, the question is reporting uncertainties that are consistent, that, are, that make sense. So if you do turn them, doesn't mean that your value is, you know, 10 times what you know, but it could be. 40% or 60% if there's significant growth in being in there. And so you say, okay, I'm going to look at information about community competition that other people are playing. And then I can say, well, in certain seasons of the year, growth in is important in this water. My uncertainties are like, I'm likely biased by X percent. If you're adding to your data, you know, so I'm not saying don't use those, but provide realistic uncertainties with the data. And depending on the method, they might be larger or they might be small. But at least they're realistic. The chapter for the other thing that comes with tail test is negative. That's the big thing I think about for tail test. The other thing that is exactly the other thing you can do is you can actually do a deep up for us as a term. Right? Just put the water sample in. And it does a lot of the, you know, all the physiology is in there, but then you have to read it quickly because it's a little punch. But read it quickly, but you can start to establish a time series of in vivo fluorescence that you can relate to periods of time when you don't have chlorophyll B. You know, so you begin to come up with proxies. And then something that Ben and I talk about all the time is do you need anybody, any measurement, anybody makes like 2.3 micrograms chlorophyll per liter? But I do agree that when they see a change in chlorophyll over time, or they see a spatial gradient, those are going to do. So we have internal consistency, we look at patterns in space and time that maybe not be so, um, so trusting of the absolute value. So think about the kind of science that you're doing, what question you need to answer. Maybe, you know, maybe that's what you're doing that you're thinking. That's more important than we a spent of these. The validation data point for a major choice, in which case you do need to have a choice. But you may not need that to do the very good work that you need. You may just need to look at kind of experience and factors to change. Right? And, and, and you have to have them to get reactions. Yeah. I need some of the passwords. Yeah. We all do. <laughs> <laughs> we all look at our passwords. That's a small time. We did with Turner last year, and you see significant change with the same Turner, which is all calibrated. That change is likely very much true. Your, your leg is changing on it. Yeah, and for that, you do not need HDLT. Yeah. And I think all the same. Oh, yeah, we want to say yeah, something. Uh, 
And, and remember, we spent the photometer, we calibrate that mm -hmm. against water. And making good water is hard, but the systems do exist. So, certain photometers are good friends. Or, or friends with special photometers, like colleagues. <laughs> <laughs> so, we, this is the last slide before we go on a break, but we'll come back. But just to remind you, don't assume data is good simply because it's already from a database. I hope that last of is there. Let the data convince you that it's usable, subjecting it to different consistency. Yeah, that's what we've talked about. So it could be, you know, between different sensors on it, relationship you expect, something you saw in the literature by people that, did, that you know, think they're doing good measurements. They were in that place several years ago, and the values are not orders of magnitude different than what you measure. And do not assume state uncertainties in papers are the real uncertainty. Uh, account for try and account for everything and always think about the unknowns, unknowns. Things that we did not think about it might <laughs> cause differences. And of course, we don't know the unknowns. But, but it's this as, as you grow in this community, every now and then there'll be a paper that points out to hey, we have not accounted for that. And that's important. So always question, 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 data question, procedure question, what everybody else is doing. If you assume that everybody else is right and you're the one wrong, you'll never discover something new. So trust yourself, build good skill, and, and slowly, slowly feel comfortable challenging what other people are doing. If you can prove to yourself that it's significantly different than what you should do. The same token, but we'll have a system the best. Absolutely. Right? You know, you establish, you can do something, you figure something out, you're like, here's the way I'm going to do it. Be very open to other ways of doing things. So don't assume that everybody's right, and don't always assume that you're right either. You know, I have students in my lab, and they're like, I don't know why we do it this way, I want to do it this way, I'm like, try it. And I'm so happy to change the way I do things. Honestly, I just, I, my ego is not wrapped up in my calibration procedure. So be open to new ideas and new ways to do all the time, no matter how long you've been in the And you find it, for some scientists, it's really hard because they have a legacy that goes with one instrument that they've used all their life, and when they're confronted with the fact that it might be wrong, it is confused. By tooth and nail, stay with them. And if you think as, as a good scientist, you want people to point your to Because you know, from that time on, you better be confused. So, people that read our papers and find mistakes in them and find mistakes in data, we submit to database thinking they were good, are our friends. They're helping us clean our legacy <laughs> from mistakes we've done. And we all do mistakes. We don't want to do mistakes, but we do it. If we are not about ourselves, it's all about finding, getting closer to the truth. If this is what science does, it's get us closer to what, how things are really are. It doesn't matter if I do it, if you do it, if somebody else does it. What matters is that as a community, we move towards a place we, we want to be in and then help us understand the issue better. So, 10 minutes, but 15 minutes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh no! <laughs> 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 oh, yeah. <laughs> Any question has no Okay. All right, it looks great. I just read the introduction. It's so beautiful. I love it. <laughs>
It was. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. It's today? Charlotte, is 2B today? Okay. 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 I'm 
Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. 